My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Among the many titles given to Jesus, Emmanuel is the most comforting. It speaks to our deep longing of our heart for God to be present to us in our joys and our sorrows. Friends and loved ones assure us that God is with us when we struggle with health issues or painful losses. To suggest God is with us is to speak to our primal need for love and assurance that no matter how terrible things may be, we are not alone. Well, what if God's presence isn't so comforting? What if God's breaking into our lives upends them and leaves us dazed and bewildered? One of the dangers of the, of the spiritual life is the temptation to domesticate God. To make God the person or being who satisfies our every wish or desire. Such a temptation reduces God to be a mere wonder worker. Moreover, it fails to appreciate God's desire to enter into relationship with us. And like all relationships, our relationship with God will push and stretch us in ways we may not always like. In truth, were God to be among us, I think we would be quite terrified. Not necessarily in the sense of fear, but rather we would be overwhelmed with the awesome wonder and magnitude of God. We simply wouldn't be able to comprehend the holy otherness of God. We're told in the Old Testament that Moses hid his face when he beheld the awesome presence of God. The people of Israel, fearful of even having a glimpse of God, would shroud Moses' face with a veil each time he came down from the mountain. Even to look at the one who had seen the face of God was too much to bear. Christian theologians would later name our paradoxical relationship with God as both mysterium tremendum and mysterium fascinosum. We are both overwhelmed by the tremendous presence of God while simultaneously drawn to the beauty and blessing of God. Such is the case today in Matthew's account of the story of Joseph. From what we gather from the text, Joseph was a man both drawn to the awesome beauty of God, while at the same time terrified of what God would demand of him. Unfortunately, we miss the significance of Joseph and his role in the story of the Nativity of Jesus. Little is written of him in the scriptures. Matthew provides the most extensive account to Joseph, but even that, just a few lines. Over the centuries, our popular piety has depicted Joseph as an old man so as to preserve Mary's purity. Or, if you're looking at selling your house, some say bury a statue of Joseph upside down and it will go quickly. Poor Joseph. Well, the Matthew says only a little about Joseph in his gospel account. What he does write tells us much about him. A close read of the text reveals Joseph as a person much like any of us. A person confronted by an agonizing dilemma of either strictly following the religious and cultural laws of his day or showing compassion and love to a woman 
whom he suspects has betrayed his honor and dignity. Unfortunately for Joseph, his plight is made all the more complex by God stepping into his story and urging him to go against all that he has held dear in his life. To understand the complexity of this situation, we need to consider a few elements of the story. The tension Joseph feels is very real in this story. We are told that he was a religious man engaged to a young woman who has been found with child. Now those details may mean little to you or I, but to Jewish persons living in the first century, those details are significant. First of all, Joseph was a righteous man. To suggest one is righteous is to indicate that the person knew the law of Moses and lived it in his life according to it. In ancient Jewish thought, when one strictly adhered to the law, one was considered righteous in the face of God. This will become a point of tension in his story. And it will be a point of tension within the Gospel of Matthew. Does living a righteous life mean a strict and slavish adherence to the law at the cost of the well-being of others? Second, we are told that he is engaged to a woman who has now been found with child. Again, to us this may mean little if anything. But at the time that Matthew was writing, engagement was understood to be a permanent affair. Marriage in ancient Judaism was a three-stage process. First, the fathers of the groom and bride would agree to bring their two children together. Then, once the children were of age, they would enter the second stage of marriage and be engaged to each other for a period of year, during which neither were allowed to live with each other. At this point of the marriage ritual, the couple were understood to be legally bound to each other. Separation at this point would mean divorce. Third and final stage of marriage was the ceremony in which the relationship was affirmed in a family way with the father of the groom presiding. Mary and Joseph, we are told, are engaged, meaning that they are legally bound to each other. However, Mary is now a child, indicating that either she and Joseph broke custom and were together before their marriage, or that Mary was with another man, or another man took advantage of her. All three possibilities would have meant shame and embarrassment for both of them, particularly so for Joseph, given the patriarchal nature of the society of the day. If Mary had an affair with another man, that would be a direct assault against Joseph's, Joseph's pride and dignity. Now this is where things get complicated for Joseph. He knows the law and he knows the rules in the book of Deuteronomy, which we don't hear about here, but they are present in his mind. According to Deuteronomy, he should not only divorce Mary, and make of her an exile, but he is to also stone her to death. But Joseph loves Mary. The law tells him to do one thing, but his heart says to do otherwise. Complicating things further, an angel appears to Joseph and tells him he must stay with Mary and protect her as she is to bear Emmanuel, God with us. What is Joseph to do? 
Some of you have been reading with Stephen Drakeford over the past few weeks this wonderful poem by W.H. Auden for the time being. In his poem, Auden, I think, captures this drama the best. He has the chorus begin. The chorus is always representative of the people. And the chorus seeds doubt, seed, can't talk, seeds doubt in Joseph's mind. They say, Mary may be pure, but Joseph, are you sure? How is one to tell? Suppose, for instance, well, maybe, maybe not. But Joseph, you know what your world, of course, will say about you anyway. Capturing the anguish, the pain, and the doubt that races through Joseph's mind, Auden has Joseph demand an answer from God only to be met by the angel Gabriel's response that he must remain with Mary. The dialogue between Gabriel and Joseph in Auden's play is worth listening to. Gabriel begins, No, you must. How then am I to know, Father, that you are just? Give me one reason. No. All I ask is one important and elegant proof that what my love had done was really at your will and that your will is love. No. You must believe. Be silent and be still. One can feel the torment Joseph endures as he yearns to know what he must do. Although the story may seem like a telenovela to us with questions of adultery and angels appearing in the sky, Joseph's struggle is real. His struggle is the struggle of all of us. Is it better to follow the letter of religious law and do as it says, even though others will suffer? Or is it better to allow the law to bend in favor of love? Well, you and I know how the story unfolds, and Joseph's choice is ultimately love, marry and save her life, and the life of the child within her. This question remains heavy on our hearts. For his part, Joseph becomes much like his namesake figure in the book of Genesis and leads Mary and Jesus into Egypt to save them from Herod's wrath. And ultimately he serves as a Moses figure, leading Mary and Jesus out of Egypt and back into the Promised Land. Although he suffered the anguish of having to make a real choice, and he probably suffered real consequences for the decision he made, because it went against everything in the religious law and the custom of the day, Joseph's decision to follow the way of love ultimately means love is allowed to be among us in Christ. Joseph's story is just as relevant to us as it was to those who first heard it. The Gospel writer Matthew will return a number of times in his Gospel to this great question. Is it better to follow the letter of the law at the expense of others' lives? Or ought we to subject law to love and endure all have the fullness of life. To you and I, the answer may seem obvious. But is it so for the devout Christian mother who learns her son is gay? Some religious groups will tell her she must reject him and expel her son from her home or put him through a conversion therapy program. It may not be so obvious an answer. 
For those who would rather choose hate in the name of religious extremism and kill and destroy those who are different from them. And I wonder, how often have we held the letter of the law knowing full well that others would suffer? Have we always shown love and compassion, the love and compassion that Joseph showed? Or have we disregarded others simply because they do not live according to our religious laws and customs? That is the question that the story leaves us with today. Amen.